Well, let's look to the Lord in prayer and ask the Spirit to instruct us. Father, thank you for your truth. We ask that you would take this, your living and inerrant word, and assault our rebellious wills, that you would inform our intellect, that we'd grow in our understanding, and that you would also stir our affections, make us greater lovers of Jesus as we sit at his feet for another teaching time as he tells us more about the end days. Give us a watchfulness and a readiness and a faithfulness that befits this understanding. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. The mischief caused by the misuse of eschatology or the study of end times not least in contemporary America, has resulted in a virtual eclipse of eschatology in the life of the church. This unfortunate set of circumstances, both its abuse and its subsequent neglect, has weakened the church rather than strengthened it. If we dispense with eschatology, the teaching on the end days, then the purpose and destiny of history fall into the hands of humanity alone. No one, I think, Christian or not, takes solace in that prospect. Unless human history, in all its greatness and potential, as well as its propensity to evil and destructiveness, can be redeemed, human life is a futile and sordid endeavor. The longing that king that things ought not to be as they are in this fallen, broken, sinful, painful world, cannot be allowed to remain as they are. That's essentially an eschatological longing. You know, as we, I don't know if it was last week or the week before, when when Jesus addresses the birth pangs, creation has been groaning within itself. I think I was sharing with a, a sister this morning, and even our bodies as we get older groan within us. And we we give more fervency to our prayer as we not only experience the uh, results of sinfulness in this dying world and our dying bodies, but we we find solace in the hope. We pray even so, come Lord Jesus, make it sooner than later. You know, you think of some of what Paul had to say to the church at. Philippi, his longing was to go to heaven, but it was more needful for him to stay behind. And so if if we're left behind, for now, today, we each got up. We're in an upright position. God's got a job for us to do. We're going to, this worship we've been engaged in, we're going to do that a lot better in heaven. We're going to see God as he is. We are going to be unhindered by the fetters of this sinful, fleshly body and able to worship Him perfectly. The grand finale of the gospel preached by Jesus is that there is a sure hope for the future. Amen? It's not a question mark. It's an exclamation point. We've read the back of the the book, and He wins. And this hope is grounded not in history, not in man's logic or intuition, but in the Word of Jesus. Solely in the Word of Jesus. You know, in the midst of pessimism and gloom and frustration of this present hour, there is one bright beacon light of hope, and that's the promise of Jesus Christ. End of story. He's the one who said, if I go and prepare a place for you, ah, what? Come again, John 14, 3. So we're finishing our little mini-series on the end times through the lens of John Mark in Mark chapter 13. Would you follow along as I read for us, beginning in verse 24. Mark 13, 24. But in those days, after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. And the stars will be falling from heaven and the powers that are in the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And then 
He will send forth the angels and will gather together his elect from the four winds from the farthest end of the earth to the farthest end of heaven. Now learn the parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer's near. Even so, you too, when you see these things happen, recognize that he is near right at the door. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But of that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. Take heed, keep on the alert, for you do not know when the appointed time will come. It's like a man away on a journey who, upon leaving his house and putting his slaves in charge, assigned to each one his task, also commanded the doorkeeper to stay on the alert. Therefore, be on the alert, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming, whether in the evening, at midnight, or when the rooster crows, or in the morning, in case he should come suddenly and find you asleep. What I say to you, I say to all, be on the alert. Has Jesus repeated himself enough to drill through our heads that the call of the hour, the call of the signs of the time, since we don't know when he's returning, is readiness, watchfulness, being awake, being alert. Because in just the next chapter, when Jesus takes his followers to the Garden of Gethsemane, and he tells them again to be alert, be watchful, be prayerful, he finds them three times asleep. Asleep at the job. So let's go with that perspective into our text this morning. Only got two points to the sermon, the outlines in the back of your bulletin. Verses 24 to 27 is the culminating event of the return of the Son of Man. The most glorious event ever to occur in future history is Jesus' return. It's the grand climax of the Olivet Discourse. Now we need to be acquainted that a perennial debate is whether to interpret this literally or figuratively. After all, many claim that such cosmic disturbances as our text begins with is too drastic. After all, we haven't had such cataclysmic signs take place for millennia. It's been a long time since the sun stood still in biblical history. Been quite a while since the Red Sea stacked itself on top of itself so that God's children could pass through as, a by on, as on dry land. Been quite a while since the opening chapters of Genesis when there was a worldwide cataclysmic flood, if you believe all that. You see, the skeptic wants to reject the miraculous. Whether it be any of the miracles Jesus did in the flesh while he sojourned here on planet Earth or any of the miraculous events that either have occurred or are yet to take place. Keep your finger here and run with me over to Second Peter, if you would. Second Peter clearly teaches that the end of the age will be marked by a vast change in the cosmic system. We're going to take Jesus' words through the mouth and the pen of John Mark in Mark 13, figuratively. We better take the rest of prophecy about these same events, figuratively. Second Peter, chapter 3. Set your eyes on verse 10, if you would. Peter says that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat. The earth and its works will be burned up. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? You see, Peter's purpose in prophecy is the same as Jesus' purpose and the other apostles. It is, uh, we are to learn that because of the way things will be, it affects how we are today. It's got a, a purging and a purifying hope. We ought to be 
characterized by holy conduct and godliness because the last thing we want Jesus to return is in the middle of our sin and serving self, right? We want a, him to find us occupying until he comes, being faithful, discharging our duty, killing sin in our lives, and sharing the gospel. So in verse 12, Peter says, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat. But according to his promise, we're looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found in him in peace, spotless and blameless, and regard the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given him, wrote to you. As also in all his letters, speaking of them of these things in which are some things hard to understand. Now, let's stop in the middle of the verse. Here's one apostle gently throwing another one under the bus saying, no, some of the things Paul's got to say is hard to understand. We're not saying that every detail of Scripture that we are intended to learn is easy stuff. You look at some of the stuff we've, we've studied on Wednesday night and we'll continue to study. When we get into the Trinity, that pops a circuit breaker in our minds. You try to understand the the Trinity, you'll go mad, but you explain it away and you'll lose your soul. Some things are hard to understand. Peter says, which the untaught and unstable distort as they do also the rest of scriptures to their own destruction. You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, be on your guard so that you are not carried away by the error of unprincipled men and fall away from your own steadfastness, but grow in the grace of and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, to Him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Now as we return back to Mark 13 with this in mind, the church has always lived in the expectation of the imminent return of Jesus. Jesus could, could rapture His church out at any moment. That's the next thing on the church's calendar. Just think that our next worship service could be in God's presence. To be absent from the body is to be in the Lord's presence. That's the reality. And that gives us hope to persevere and continue on because in the bleak backdrop of all that's going on on planet Earth, it's very easy to get jaded and to lose hope unless it's a biblical hope placed in substantial reality in the very Word of Christ. So as we do return to Mark 13... How do we take this? Figurative or literally? Thank you, we'll take it literally. This paragraph may have phenomenal language. It's not even figurative terminology. There will be objective crisis events in the physical universe, and Jesus calls people to recognize it. When you see, when you observe this taking place, Jesus is right at the door. He's already talked about the decimation of the temple in the early part of the chapter. Then talked about uh, the abomination of desolation, which takes place three and a half years into the Great Tribulation. And as these cataclysmic events that come from the lips of Jesus in verse 24, is whatever generation it is that enters into tribulation and observes these facts, Jesus is there. We have to recognize it. No, we understand miracles aren't the norm. Except for when Jesus did them. Or he gave authority to designated apostles to work wonders to authenticate their message while scripture was being written. And yes, if we want to be literal about it, conversion is a miracle every time God takes a life that was dead in their transgressions and sins and makes them alive in Christ, gives them new life. There is that miracle of conversion. When we hear people's testimony in, ba in the waters of baptism, it's a, it's a miracle service. We're celebrating the work of God's saving grace in individuals. So we understand miracles aren't the norm and these cataclysmic events are, are not the norm, but they are coming. In Bible interpretation, we always take the scriptures in their normal sense unless it makes no sense. The text must inform us. The text must drive us to take it otherwise. To take it figuratively. 
Otherwise, it's too subjective. One person takes it this way, another person takes it that way. Hermeneutical hopscotch all over the place. We're talking a consistently literal interpretation that's grammatical and historical. There's the grammar of the text and a real history of the day that drives objective meaning. Because what it meant to the original audience is what it means to us. So Jesus, having, having said all those introductory remarks, Jesus says in verse 24, in those days after the tribulation. He had already explained in last week's paragraph Daniel's 70th week, this time of Jacob's trouble, seven years of great tribulation, especially the second half. Jesus moves the explanation a little further, pushes the envelope, if you will, as he continues to warn not to be deceived by the coming of false Christ instead of the true Christ. Jesus said, to whatever generation is alive when this occurs, when you see the, the sun darkened, the moon not given its light, the stars falling from heaven, the powers that are in heaven shaken, in other words, as a heavenly earthquake going on, know that Jesus is right at the door. Not any would-be messiahs, the antichrists that are coming and are already here. Sun darkened, moon not given light, stars falling, powers of heaven shaken. Where does this come from? Is, is Jesus just kind of snatching random thoughts out of thin air? Or is he tying into cosmic terms that are not to be taken figuratively or politically or speaking of international upheaval as we've got a lot of newspaper exegetes of our day? Look, prophecy is being fulfilled in our midst. Really? He'd already talked about wars, earthquakes, famines that the Old Testament prophets had foretold of the coming dreadful day of the Lord. So as he continues on, verse 24, 25, sun, moon, stars. Again, keep your finger here and run back to Isaiah with me. Did Isaiah speak in the same way? Well, yes, he did. But Isaiah 13. Isaiah 13, 6, if you would. Here Isaiah is foretelling about judgment on the day of the Lord. He says, wail, for the day of the Lord's near. It will come as destruction from the Almighty. Therefore, all hands will fall limp. Every man's heart will melt. They'll be terrified. Pains and anguish will take hold of them. They will writhe like a woman in labor. They'll look at one another in astonishment, their faces aflame. Verse 9, Isaiah says, Behold, the day of the Lord is coming, cruel with fury and burning anger to make the land a desolation, and he'll exterminate its sinners from it. For the stars of heaven and their constellations will not flash forth their light. The sun will be dark when it rises, and the moon will not shed its light. Familiar words to the ears of those disciples that are being taught by Jesus that day. Was Isaiah the lone wolf, prophet and preacher of that great and de dreadful day of the Lord? No. Ezekiel, over in Ezekiel 32. And again, we, always, we can't always go to all the, the references. This would just be another. Ezekiel 32, verse 7. And when I extinguish you, I will cover the heavens and darken their stars. I will cover the sun with a cloud and the moon will not give its light. All the shining lights in the heavens I will darken over you and will set darkness on your land, declares the Lord God. I will also trouble the hearts of many peoples when I bring your destruction among the nations into lands which you have not known. Just think about this. In, in Revelation, John the Apostle tells us that when God is, is raining down wrath on planet Earth, they recognize this is the hand of God doing it. This is the dreadful day. Verse 10, I'll 
Make many peoples appalled at you, and their kings will be horribly afraid of you when I brandish my sword before them, and they will tremble every moment, every man for his own life on the day of your fall. I was interacting with a friend this week from high school days who just put new tabs and a new Bible. And uh, I, I said, yeah, you remember what it was like growing up in church where we never were taught to memorize the books of the Bible in order? And she said, yeah, what still trips me up is those minor prophets, those pesky minor prophets like the order. Well, let's go over to Joel, if you can find Joel, where your pages are stuck together. Joel 2. Joel 2.10. Before them, the earthquakes, the heavens tremble. So there's that heavenly earthquake again. The, the sun and the moon grow dark and the stars lose their brightness. The Lord utters his voice before his army. Surely his camp is very great. For strong is he who carries out his word. The day of the Lord is indeed great and very awesome. And who can endure it? Yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart. And with fasting, weeping, and mourning, and rend your heart and not your garments. Now return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness and relenting of evil. Who knows whether he will not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, even a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. You know, this precious gospel hope here. You know, when I was over in Israel, there's a statue of Joel where, where he says here, uh, rend your heart and not your garments. Let it be a conversion of the heart. Taking out that heart of stone, that rebellious heart and replaced with a heart of flesh, which is compliant and repentant towards the Lord. It's a, another reason to teach about eschatology because coming up right after the tribulation, is where God casts off rebel sinners for all of eternity in hell. You ought to repent if your heart's not too hardened. If you've got questions, again, we'd love to talk to you about Christ. But when this occurs, going back to our text in Mark 13, it's going to defy scientists, pseudoscientists, astronomers, and astrologers. But, you know, this world has always been more out of man's control or understanding anyways and just grows more as he or she rejects divine revelation of how it all began as well as how it will all end. And I, like you, find much comfort in God's Word, not man's surmisings. All we can do is take God's Word at face value. The stars falling in the future will be in this continual state, stressing its duration, star after star plummeting from the heavens. The power in heaven shaken, sounds like an earthquake. You see the great simplicity as you, you, you come to verse 26? Then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. The one capstone event that forms the climax of the age is the return of Jesus Christ. Remember where Jesus is teaching this? He is sitting on the Mount of Olives and that's exactly where his feet are going to plant again when he comes back. No long interval. That generation that sees the stars falling and everything darkness and the powers in heaven shaken, the next thing is Jesus coming on the clouds. This is his Jesus' own title for Himself, we've often seen Him refer to Himself as the Son of Man. The, the disciples would clearly understand this to be Him. You know, as we looked last week in Daniel's prophecy, Daniel identify, uh, talks about the Son of Man and Jesus identifies Himself as that One. The Son of Man in the vision of Daniel 7, verse 13. This is the same one who, as they were coming up to Jerusalem, not too many days hence, three times prophesied that when we get up to Jerusalem, I'm going to suffer and die and rise again.
This is the one who ministered on earth and the one who will return with great power and glory. God's visible appearance, a a display of great glory and power often associated with the clouds. In verse 27, then he will send forth the angels, will gather together his elect from the four winds from the farthest end of the earth to the farthest end of heaven. You know, this is the third time in this chapter that Jesus has mentioned his elect ones, those that he set his love upon. It asserts his choice, not man's choice, his ownership of those that he's redeemed for the praise of his own great name. Yes, we do love the doctrine of election, which speaks of all the redeemed. Even as you look about Israel not being a people and God making them a people and choosing them for Himself. The old Baptist preacher Spurgeon said, I believe the doctrine of election because I am quite certain that if God had not chosen me, I should never have chosen Him. And I am sure He chose me before I was born or else He would have never chosen me afterwards. And He must have elected me for reasons unknown to me, for I never could find in myself why He should have looked upon me with special love. So I am forced to accept that great biblical doctrine. Signs C.H. Spurgeon. And though some would interpret the scene here to include believers of all the ages, implying resurrection of the dead, if you during tea time last Sunday afternoon, looked at your bulletin insert, you saw a timeline on one side and on the back side of the, of the insert some of our doctrinal statements about the rapture and about the tribulation followed by the return of Jesus Christ. This specific uh, reference here is not to the elect of the ages. It is to those who are alive during the tribulation that Jesus was just teaching on. Even though Gentiles will be saved, it's going to be mostly Jews as there's promised a national turning. doesn't include the church. The church is already in heaven at this time. But people alive in all parts of the world that have come through the tribulation. Because again, another promise that has not been fulfilled yet you jot down in your notes Zechariah 12, verses 10 and 11. Zechariah, speaking for God, says, I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication so that they will look on me whom they have pierced. And they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son. And they will weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. In that day there will be great mourning in Jerusalem like the mourning of Hadarim in the plain of Megiddo. During this tribulation hour, the Jewish people will recognize we missed our Messiah and they will place their faith in Him. And scores of Jewish people nationally will turn to Him. Jesus does say here that the angels are going to be part of this gathering, this inbringing from the farthest ends of the earth and the farthest end of heaven. In regards to those angelic ministers and helpers, the French theologian John Calvin gave this eloquent and moving comment when he said, quote, Whenever, therefore, we perceive the church, the church scattered by the wiles of Satan, or torn in pieces by the cruelty of the ungodly, or disturbed by false doctrines, or tossed about by storms, let us learn to turn our eyes to this gathering of that elect. And if it appears to us a thing difficult to be believed, let us call to remembrance the power of the angels, which Christ holds out to us for the express purpose of raising our views above human means. For though the church be now tormented by the malice of men, 
or even broken by the violence of the billows and miserably torn in pieces so as to have no stability in the world. Yet we ought always to cherish confident hope because it will not be by human means, but by heavenly power, which will be far superior to every obstacle that the Lord will gather his church. And to that we give a hearty amen and amen. Yeah, it's true. We, we, we mentioned last week that the rapture event of the church is not mentioned here in Mark 13 like it is in First Thessalonians 4 and other texts. John Mark's presentation of eschatology doesn't mention it because it's not crucial for his purpose. But in First Thessalonians 4, for those that may be taking notes, First Thessalonians 4.15, Paul writes to the saints at Thessalonica. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. In other words, your dead loved ones who have died in Christ. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ, will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds. Notice this is the rapture, not when Jesus' feet touch Olivet. There in the clouds we'll meet the Lord in the air, so we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, what's the purpose of prophecy taught well, a study of eschatology? It is worship. It is encouragement. It is comfort. He says, therefore, comfort one another with these words. Trust God that as He has exposed His truth, so we live in light. We anchor our lives in the Word of Christ. There was a meme on social media recently that's got a picture of Noah's Ark that says, sometimes faith makes you look stupid until it starts to rain. Signed, Noah. You know, and as we in the church talk about what God's plan is, many scoffers, many of the foolish people in the world, yeah, you, that's a, a pipe dream. That's children's stories. Things just continue as they've continued, as we read about in Peter. Point two. Concluding exhortations that his return motivates. Verses 28 to 37. There's three in particular. So having brought this eschatological picture to a grand climax, Jesus concludes this section, this discourse on Mount Olivet with a few instructions. Number one is the lesson of the fig tree. He says in verse 28, learn the parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender, puts forth its leaves, you know summer's near. Now, let me remind you how we interpret parables. Throughout church history, some interpreters have tried to make parables work, walk on all fours, so even just story details have some kind of spiritual counterpart. Not necessarily. There's one main point to every story Jesus tells. This is a very short parable, one of the shortest parables Jesus ever told with one main point. Now, I as I exert a little sanctified speculation here, I don't know this, but there was probably a fig tree at hand as Jesus was teaching because he could use anything at any time. Kind of like when Jesus was teaching on worry in Matthew 6 and says, behold, the sparrows, there's probably one flying overhead right then. He just right then taught based on that. Well, so Jesus teaching this story on a, a fig tree. There was a recognized symbol of Israel, but might not have any significance in our text here. The reference is a literal tree. Common in Palestine, olive trees wouldn't serve an appropriate example because olive trees are evergreens. You can't tell seasons based on evergreens. You know, as you're getting ready to hack down a tree, you're usually looking, are there buds? Well, evergreens don't have buds. It's only the only kind of tree for this particular lesson. So Jesus says, learn the parable of the fig tree. 
It's an imperative. Disciples, don't miss the lesson. When the branch becomes tender, in other words, the sap starts to flow, followed by sprouting leaves. It unequivocally means summer's here, right around the corner. This was the earliest sign. Kind of like the buds on the trees around here as we came in with our allergies and our tissues this morning. And uh, we got one particular tree out here that we always track right into the church. All those white blossoms everywhere. So was the fig tree. The earliest sign that summer is right around the corner. I just made another fire this morning. I'm not going to get a chance to make too many more because we got these blossoms telling us that spring's here, one moment, gone the next. But before we know it, we're going to be in triple digits and smoke and fire season around here. Even so, you too. Or in the King James, in like manner. So Jesus is pointing this out as an analogy. Between a careful observation in the material realm, you see the buds and the leaves that start fashion. Summer's right around the corner. There's also a duty in the spiritual realm. Understand the moral significance of these crucial world events that he has unpacked for them. Not in, like I said earlier, not in our day with newspaper exegetes and prophecies by upstart messiahs. But when the signs and the displays literally unfold before your watching eyes, the eyes of the tribulation saints, he is near, he is right at the door. Notice that. You know summer's near. Even so, you too, when you see these things, verse 29, recognize He is near right at the door. When a generation of believers sees the decimation of the temple, seven years of great tribulation, the decimation of the sky, darkness, Christ is virtually here. Recognize this, he says. Know it. He urges them to realize what indeed is taking place. So the question is, are you ready, dear friend? As he calls them to readiness. When Jesus promised his disciples that he would one day return to earth, he said he would come at a day that they did not expect. Therefore, people today who set dates for Christ's second coming are really Wasting their time and ours. Jesus never told his followers how to calculate the day of his return, but he did emphasize our main priority is to make sure we're ready for him and occupied in his service when he comes. Don't be snoozing. No spiritual sluggards. A woman who lived by this teaching was shopping in a small country store. Several young people just standing around doing nothing. Knowing she was a Christian, they began ridiculing her. We hear you're expecting Jesus to come, they jeered. That's right, she replied brightly. Do you really believe he's coming, they asked. Absolutely, she answered. They said, well, you'd better hurry home and get ready. He might be on the way. Facing them, she said, I don't have to get ready. I keep ready. Friends, are you... Keeping ready, are you ready for the arrival of God's Son? Will you be glad to see Jesus when He returns? If not, get ready. Without delay, turn from your sin, trust Christ as Savior and Lord, and then keep ready by walking in His will as revealed in Scripture day after day. You know, two unusual things happened as I was sitting in the restaurant, having a breakfast of bagel and coffee. First, read an article on the front page of the newspaper. It quoted a certain Christian author who authorized that Christ would call millions of Christians to heaven before sundown that particular day. A few minutes later, a friend walked up, sat down, began to tell me that his 
life had been dramatically changed. He said that for the first time in his life, he was ready to meet the Lord. You know, that was good news. Since we often discussed his unwillingness to live in a manner consistent with his claim to be a Christian. Easy to profess to be a Christian without possessing Christ in our lives. He said he decided it was all or nothing. He had an amazing peace and now he was also concerned about others. So when I asked him what had happened, he told me he'd read the book I'd been reading about in the newspaper. He said he finally realized that whether Christ came on he would have to stand before the Lord eventually. And that got to him. To claim that Christ will come today may result in a false alarm. But to believe that Christ may come today and that we will have to answer to him will motivate us to live for him. And so again, the question is, are you ready? The motivating effect of eschatological teaching. Don't be unprepared. Be in Christ. Be forgiven of your sins. Be confessed and up to date with sin and in your service to the king. Number two is the date of consummation, verses 30 to 32. Overall, these three verses confirm three aspects about fulfillment. It's of limited duration for their fulfillment, verse 30. The certainty of the fulfillment, verse 31. And the unrevealed time of this fulfillment, verse 32. Look at them again. He said, truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But of that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. So Jesus said, truly I say to you. He it marks an important statement. It's not as if anything else Jesus said is not important, but it kind of bold faces it and underscores it in our hearing. Demanding serious attention. This generation. Now it's generally held that it means those living at the time Jesus was speaking. But I think that view falls apart. Because that generation did not see the fulfillment of the eschatological aspects of the discourse Jesus has taught on ever since verse 1 of chapter 13. In 70 AD, when Jerusalem was sacked, yeah, it was sacked. It's going to be sacked worse. And all the other stuff Jesus said will be fulfilled as well. Not just portions. Things that kind of look almost there. Only one view that is consistent is if that future generation is the one that will see the actual fulfillment and the beginning of the events spoken of, especially verses 14 to 23. And the assurance is that this end time crisis is limited in duration. It's not indefinite. When we're going through our normal trials of life, or epic trials that we go through, a moment feels like an eternity, doesn't it? And so the, this kind of bolsters hope, this date of consummation. It's of limited duration. Verse 31 would be a great memory verse this week. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word, says Jesus, will not pass away. It's very short, it's easy to memorize, and it's got such profundity in it there's the positive assurance that the cosmic order falling apart is going to happen as divinely determined. But guess what doesn't fall apart? God's Word, His promises. Now, it, this verse has particular application to this eschatological section of Mark 13. But it holds equally true for all His teachings. Yeah, the context of verse 31 is the whole chapter of Mark 13 in eschatology. But generally, God's Word is the only sure thing. That's what we affirm at Grace Bible Church. Capital B Bible believers here. That this, is, this book is inspired by God, finding its origin in Him. He literally breathed it out. That this is inerrant. It's recorded without error. It's authoritative over our lives, so we sit under it to be schooled by it rather than stand over it as critic. 
and it's absolutely sufficient, offering all the answers that we need to life. And yet people want more. Personal, additional revelation because 66 books are not enough. And yet Jesus says that his words will never lose their validity. This calm assurance that God's word is the stabilizing factor, that's good news. With the backdrop of black, bleak times. Everything's on God's plan. A fantastic claim by the Son of Man who is also the Son of God who will bring it to pass. No one knows. While it's going to have speedy fulfillment, it's clear, the precise timing is hidden from all but the Father. A clear warning against all attempts at date setting. Yet, as many times as Jesus warned and said it, repeated, ignoring. Not angels, nor the Son. And let's be careful here. This verse does not deny the deity of Christ, even though during the Arian controversy, the Orthodox Church found it embarrassing. What? Not even the Son of God knows? Let's remember that any passage that talks about Jesus self-emptying His limitations in the flesh are enhancing His true humanity. And yet any time He's reading somebody's heart or prophesying, doing something only God could do, it's bringing to the surface His deity. Jesus was and is the God-man forevermore. So when you come to a text like this, we're looking at his humanness. He sees hearts. He tells his disciples of... You remember, remember our scripture reading this morning in uh, John 21? He told them, you're fishing on the wrong side, but he's uh, casting nets over here an instant 153 fish. That's divine. God's wisdom graciously withheld any definite date for the second coming. If we knew when to get ready, we would procrastinate, wait to the last. You know, when, when you know mom and dad's coming home or, or your spouse is coming home, better hurry up and do the dishes and clean the house. And you guys know, you guys laughing because it's as if I'm the only one that does this. Otherwise, no living believer would experience the purifying hope of His coming, 1 John 3, 2 and 3. It has a purifying effect. If Jesus could come any moment, then we are ready any moment. That great evangelist, George Whitfield, prayed, Lord, someday I will be like Thee. And if someday, why not today when I can be the greatest blessing to the most people? Don't put off for tomorrow or next week or next year what needs to be done today. Thirdly, the need for watchfulness, verses 33 to the end. He says, take heed, keep on alert. This is the practical duty commanded. This is no suggestion. For the fourth time, our Savior sounds the call to alertness. He did it in verse 5, did it in verse 9, did it in verse 23 and yet does it again now in verse 33, take heed, keep on the alert. Fourth time. Recall this whole section is not merely informational to get our fact checkers right. It's a call to action. How should we behave based on this knowledge? Keep on the alert. It has the root meaning of to chase sleep like you do with that energy drink when you've fallen asleep on the five. The call to be awake. Keep on the alert. Chase the sleep away. We'll see the, this failure shortly ignored in Gethsemane in Mark 14. The key feature of this section of, is that it's unique to Mark. This parable of the absent householder, verses 34 and following, it enforces the call to watchfulness. Notice the second story Jesus tells here. 
It's like a man away on a journey who, upon leaving his house, puts his slaves in charge, assigning to each one his task. You know, you're doing the dishes, you're doing the weeding, you're doing the sweeping. Also commanded the doorkeeper, stay on the alert. Don't let the boogeyman in. Don't let the thieves break through and steal. Pastors, keep preaching. People, keep serving with your spiritual gifts. Command to the doorkeeper, watch. That's his standing duty. A different word than he used in verse 32. It has this basic meaning of being aroused from sleep. So that first one is chase sleep away. And this other one is, you remember, ever been scared awake? Both verbs have the idea of being awake and watchful. Verse 35, therefore, be on the alert. How many times do you got to say it? You don't know. It gives a popular designation of four watches of the night. It might be at midnight, might be when the cock crows, might be in the wee hours of the morning. It suddenly finds you asleep. Suddenly, it isn't so much the speed of the event as it's the unexpectedness. No time for spiritual slumber, dear servant of God. We cannot grow unresponsive to the hope of his return. It demands action. Be on the alert. This is the duty of watchfulness upon Christ's followers in every age and generation making every day fit for him to see and at any moment ready to meet him face to face. So all of life becomes preparation to meet the king. You got that, friends, as we leave this place of worship today? This is just one parable. Matthew gives four different parables teaching on watchfulness and faithfulness and service like this one does. How about you? Because we think the reality is more than what we can see today. You know, when I was a child, I was taught that the earth is whirling on its axis. Teachers and textbooks told me a person standing on the equator is rotating with the earth at a thousand miles an hour. I believed it then, I do today. But honestly, it doesn't seem that we're moving at all. You know, I wish I had some of this momentum to move me up the hills. Appearances are deceiving. In my childhood, I was also taught God rules over all things and that Jesus who died and rose from the grave, ascended to heaven, will come back to earth someday. Believed it then? Believe it more now. And yet when bad things keep happening in the world and wicked people seem to be in control, I think we've got to admit, can't understand why some unbelievers would scoff at those of us who say that Jesus will return as He promised. Once again, appearances can be deceiving. Because of the spiritual vision that God gives us when we believe in Christ, we can see the bigger picture. We read the Bible about his awesome deeds and all that he said and did. We sense the Lord's presence every time we pray. We experience his grace and peace in our trials and tribulations. Each of us can therefore say, even though it may not look like it now, as the earth is going to hell in a handbasket, I believe Jesus is coming again. And that that demands action. Being on the alert, being watchful. And though the words of the Olivet Discourse are specifically for the generation going into the tribulation, the truths serve to instruct believers of every age. Temptations come in many forms. False prophets raising false hopes. Mistaken signs raise fears and anxiety. Viewing the Lord's delay with complacency and neglect. A lack of knowledge inducing resignation and defeat. None of that can be true of us. It must not be true. Five times 
With three words, Jesus induces his disciples to watch and be alert. No spiritual slumber allowed. Be especially zealous, even in your evangelistic encounters, to rescue the perishing that they might escape to Christ from the impending judgment of God. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for the scriptures that we can anchor our hopes in the bedrock truth of who you are and what you have planned. Thank you that Jesus died the death we each one deserved and rose triumphantly over the grave like we will do in that future resurrection. And Lord, as we come around your table and reflect upon the blood poured out for sinners such as us, Jesus condescending and emptying himself, strapping on humanity that he might live the perfect life under your law that, that we broke. Continue to meet with your church as we celebrate the place now. Amen. I'm going to ask the men to come and hand out the...